years ago when I came to Liberty Crossings, I had an experience here in just my first few weeks here that has stuck with me now over five years. Because as a pastor, when you come to a church for the first time, people don't really know you and they certainly don't know if they can trust you. So usually there's a period of time that goes on before people confide in you and share with you things that they are going through or dealing with in their life. And that makes sense. We live in a world where we see on TV people breaking their vows, politicians and leaders doing things that cause us to be cynical. I think, you know, in life where people leak secrets and leak the truth so much so that I think it's increasingly hard for people to come to a pastor or even a doctor or a counselor and not have some kind of skepticism about the idea of trust and confidentiality. So it really struck me and grabbed my attention in my first few weeks here at Liberty Crossings when someone came up to me and shared something with me that I could tell was really hard. And they prefaced the conversation, as I remember, by by saying that they were ashamed to tell me what they were going to tell me and that they felt guilty about it and that it was just something hard to share. Now, as a pastor my mind started going to all kinds of things. I didn't know if this was going to end up with the police. (laughs) I I didn't know, you know, what kind of epic thing, but I got to tell you, I was thinking about some pretty big things because I could see the pain on the person's face. And they even said to me that they were ashamed to tell me this. So I could tell it was something serious. And so I said, well, you you can tell me anything. And, of course, whatever you share with me is confidential. And what they confessed to me was not what I was expecting. They confessed to me with shame and embarrassment and guilt that they weren't happy. That they weren't happy. That wasn't what I was expecting. I think the look on my face probably conveyed that that wasn't what I was expecting. I was expecting some major moral failure. But what they confessed to me was much more universal. That in the midst of relative luxury, not just 1%, but in the global context, the top 1% of 1%, in a life of relative luxury, in a stable, loving, with a stable, loving family, with great kids and a great spouse, a wonderful house and a wonderful neighborhood with wonderful schools and wonderful health care and wonderful vacations to the beach and then to the mountains. That they found themselves at home one day and the tears came. And they were tears of sadness about an emptiness inside. Just this week, I was listening to an interview on the radio. It was recorded years ago with the writer David Foster Wallace, who had written a book called Infinite Jest. And he was talking about how when he was in his 30s in New York City, he had a group of friends in their 30s. They were all way too educated, had way too many resources, had the ability to go and see whatever they wanted to see and do whatever they wanted to do. But one day, and they were talking with one another, what they discovered about each other is that all of them were experiencing this vague disappointment about life. You could say they were wondering, is this all there is? You could say they were feeling an empty place inside. And he went on to say something that was really interesting that I thought stuck with me. He... he, made the point that people with little or people with a lot experience that emptiness inside, that thought that there's, there's something more, that, that there's something more to life than they've discovered. It, it's a, it's an, a, a yearning, it's an aching, it's an, an emptiness inside that can feel like sadness or unhappiness. He, he said people who have very little experience that, and people who have a lot experience it, but the people who have a lot... In addition addition to experiencing it, they feel guilt for experiencing it because of how much they do have. So in addition to that sadness and that emptiness in their lives, they feel guilty for feeling sad and empty. And then in many settings, anxious because everyone around them seems to have it together. 
seem so happy, seem so joyful in their front yard playing ball or in pictures on Facebook that it makes that vague disappointment about life even more painful. What I gather from that and from my own sense is that there really is something wrong, something deeply wrong with us, but it's the rare person who says so. The person who came to me and trusted me to tell me that story, I don't think their experience was unique. I think what was unique about them was having the courage to say it out loud, to say out loud what so many of us feel inside, what writer Henry David Thoreau probably was referring to when he said the great mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. It's not the rare person that feels that, it's the rare person who has the courage to say it out loud. And so we build our lives as this great menagerie of distraction with as many things as we can cram in to distract us from what we feel when we're alone. And we go here, we go to trips or the lake or the beach, we cram as much as we possibly can, sports and activities and nights out, everything we can cram in to distract us from ourselves. We cram it all in. I think it's interesting that somehow when we cram more and more in, we end up feeling emptier and emptier. Isn't that weird? What does that point us to? I think another telling thing is that we flee from the quiet like it's the plague. Quiet alone time for many people is scarier than any plague, than any disaster. To be alone and unmedicated with whatever drug of choice you have, whether that's TV or whether it's an actual drug, to be alone with ourselves is a scary thing because that feeling and that voice inside seems all the louder and we don't want to be alone with that feeling we want to be with people and around noise and tv and stories and games and apps all these things but what i want to suggest to you is that that feeling is a gift and what i'm telling you is is counterculture i'm asking you to question the very nature of reality as you understand it. That that feeling inside isn't something to run from, that that feeling inside is something to run toward. That that feeling inside is a God-given guide, G-U-I-D, a guide to be listened to, guiding you towards the truth about reality and who you are. It points to the truth It pulls back the grand deception and tells you, you are not a physical being. And so physical things can never satisfy you. They can never fill you up. All the things that you could buy or get or see or do, the physical things can never solve the spiritual problem. What's missing is spiritual because you're a spiritual being. So physical things can never fix that. But to begin... We have to choose to want to know the truth. That's a big choice. There's a great movie that came out years ago. It came out on Easter weekend. It wasn't an accident. And in the movie, one of the real themes is about knowing the truth. And I'm not talking about a few good men. You can't handle the truth. I'm not talking about that. Different movie. But another movie about the truth and about whether you really want to know the truth and about the deception that we live in. I I think we live in a deception. I think our world deceives us. And I think everything around us is telling us that this will satisfy you, this will satisfy, that will satisfy. You're a physical being, so physical things will solve your problems. Let me suggest at risk of sounding insane in a world that says that that's crazy, that those are all lies. In reality, you're not a physical being. So physical things can never satisfy you because you're a spiritual being. But to know that and explore it involves a choice. Has anybody ever seen the movie The Matrix? If you have, you know where I'm going. The pills. All right, take a look. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up. 
Ironically, this is not far from the truth. Do you believe in fate, Neil? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. I know exactly what you mean. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. If you saw this movie, it probably blew your mind like it did mine. And I went back to see it. The Wachowski brothers released this movie on Easter, and it was no accident. The main, one of the main characters there, Morpheus, his name means change. It comes from the Greek word morphu, which means to be transformed, to be changed. It was also used by the Greeks to talk about what happens to a baby in their mother's womb before their birth. It's the formation. It's the same word that Paul used throughout his writings to talk about us being reformed in Christ, to be formed by Christ. He used that same word morphu, which is taken by this man as Morpheus, the agent of change. And then Keanu Reeves, some of y'all's favorite actor, I'm sure. His name is Neo, which means new, changing to what's new. But, but just like here, what has to happen first is a desire to see truth as truth, to, to see the truth, to accept the truth, to be willing to see and accept that we are spiritual beings and to see that the other way of seeing the world is, just as he said, slavery, slavery to the mind, slavery to the spirit. We are not physical beings. We are spiritual beings with a spiritual home, with a spiritual creator who can only find peace in our spiritual connection to God. We are spiritual beings, not physical. And spirituality, far from something with crystals out west that a few people do on a mountaintop, it is rather our fulfillment, our completeness, our peace. It is the answer that God has given us to discover our true selves, to find rest and peace in God. Now, for many of us, though, we think of spirituality as an aspect of our lives, right? You have your work life, your family life, your spiritual life. It's just this one little piece of, of my life. 
But the writer of the book that I shared with you talks about it in a different way and in a way that really inspired me when he said this. The goal of this book is to help us to grow spiritually. But it's hard to write about, listen to this, it's hard to write about spiritual formation in a way that captures the urgency of the subject. Because too often people think about their spiritual lives as just one more aspect of their existence alongside their financial life or their vocational life or their family life. Periodically, periodically they may try to get their spiritual life together and start praying more regularly. I'm going to read my Bible more. It's the religious equivalent of going on a diet or trying to stick to a budget or joining a gym in January. The truth is that the term spiritual life is simply a way of referring to one's entire life. Every moment, every facet of it from God's perspective. Another way of saying it is this, God is not interested in your spiritual life. He's just interested in your life. God is not interested in this falsely labeled piece or compartment of you that you call spiritual life. He's just interested in your life because you are spiritual. And the spiritual life is one of transformation, of being transformed. Not what you do, but more the inside of why you do it. And Christianity as an expression of the spiritual life isn't getting you to be good little soldiers who do the right thing and turn left and turn right when you're supposed to, but more it's a change of the heart. It's a change of the desire and what it is that gives you passion and joy because the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you. It's a journey that takes us to a place where we are attentive, maybe for the first time, attentive to reality the reality of who we are, our spiritual nature. Some would call it a becoming. What I would call it is a re-becoming. And because of that transformation, you can see how the spiritual life is a tremendous source of hope. The source of despair for people in themselves, in their marriages, in their families, in work, is when they think that change isn't possible. That's where despair comes from is when people think there's no way something can change. The corollary is true as well. That transformation and the promise of it is the source of hope. So first we have to decide that we want to know the truth about ourselves and about our lives, which I think means coming to see that we are sold so many lies that tell us we're not spiritual, that, that, that tell us that it's only that don't tell us that it's only spiritual things that can satisfy us. But beyond that, we have to decide what we're going to do with that truth. If you are with me and agree that you are a spiritual being, then you might say, well, okay, wait, now what? And I would say, listen to this story. When I was a boy, I went to church. I was blessed to go to a good church, and we'd go to vacation Bible school. There was a lady there, and this is before screens. This is before transparent overhead projectors. This is a long time ago. High tech for Sarah Alice Godwin, my VBS teacher. High tech for her was a felt board. Does anybody know what a felt board is? Okay, you're old, all right? Because most people here probably don't know. She had this board with felt on it, and she cut out figures with her own fingers, okay? Not a computer. She used scissors, these little things that cut stuff, all right? Maybe you've seen them or heard of them in a museum. She took scissors, and she cut these things out, and she stuck them on the board and tells the story. And it was, you know, engaging. It was awesome. It was like the first app, you know, and she would stick them on the board, and I remember her telling us the story of Moses, okay? You remember that? The first stories you learn in church if you you grew up, Noah and the flood and Moses, and so she had Moses, and he's going through the woods. He's got some sheep following him, and then he comes up, and there's this bush there, and she's like, oh, Moses came up on a bush, and we're like, yeah, okay, that's exciting, and but we're little kids, so, you know, we're with her, and she says, close your eyes, and so we all closed our eyes, because that's what you do what you're told when you're four, mostly. Close your, we closed our eyes, and I heard this rustling sound, 
And we opened her eyes. She goes, look, the bush is on fire. And she had taken a, a red piece of felt and stuck it on the bush. But it was cut the same shape as the bush, but with little points on top. The bush is on fire. And we're like, whoa, this is cool. That's how I learned about Moses, right? There were some things about the story, though, that I didn't notice then that are particularly relevant now. Why is it relevant to what I'm talking about? Didn't Moses become used by God to set people free from slavery? And isn't that what we're talking about? Being set free? Hear these words from Exodus chapter 3. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing but not consumed. Now, I want you to notice these next two verses. Even if you know this story inside and out, you've never paid attention probably to these two verses. Verse 3, then Moses said, and I'm going to add parenthetically to himself, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. So he's talking to himself. I must stop and turn aside. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, not before, not before, but once he saw that Moses was willing to stop what he was doing, stop where he was going, and turn aside from his path, when the Lord saw he had stopped and turned aside to see, God called to him, not before, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said these words, I've observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. God is saying that today. I just want to tell you, he's still saying that to people who are slaves. It may not be in Egypt, it may not be chains. But if it's a false reality that enslaves you to emptiness in your heart, in anything less than abundant life, that God says the very same thing to you that he said to Moses. I've observed the misery of my people who are in this room today. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Many of you know what it's like to live under a taskmaster. Maybe it's your job, whatever it is that's controlling you. Maybe it's a substance, whatever it may be. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land, out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites. It's as if he's saying to us, the, your cry, or maybe saying your secret cry in your heart. The cry of the Israelites has come to me I've seen how the Egyptians oppress them, oppress you. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Isn't that what God is always doing? Is it that his primary purpose is to set us free from the chains that we put on ourselves? From our self-inflicted bondage? Which for us in many cases may mean that we've chosen to embrace a false reality, a false understanding of life as physical rather than spiritual? Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I? We say that so many times, but, but God, who am I for this or that? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I'll be with you. My experience is that's usually God's answer. Not I'll do it for you, but I'll be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that it's I who sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Moses had an opportunity to stop what he was doing and to turn 
turn what he, from what he was doing and turn toward God. Now, he was just on a trail on a mountainside with some sheep with him, okay? But he was busy. This was his daily routine. He was taking them from here to there in the morning and from here to there at night. It's what he did every day. The sooner he got home, the sooner he got to go to bed. The sooner he got home, he got to eat. He was eager to get home just like we were. Our, our equivalent would be probably Highway 280, okay? And he, he's going along the Highway 280 of sheep herders, you know, trying to get home from work when he notices something off there. And a lot of times I just dismiss things that are in my way or a distraction or would interrupt me because I'm trying to get where I'm going and the people in front of me are going too slow, and the, but the people behind me are tailgating me. Isn't that weird? They're going too slow, but they're tailgating me. It's weird. But he sees something, but then he thinks, well, this is 280, 280 uh, sheep trail. I, I would have to make a U-turn, which will take an hour now that they've changed everything. I'll, I'll have to make a U-turn to go over there and see what that thing is. And, man, I don't have time for that. Because notice, it, he just notices out of his corners, I something unique. God doesn't say, hey, Moses, come over here. There's no billboard. There's no neon sign. It's just something kind of out of the ordinary that he notices out of the corner of his eye. But for some reason, he decided to allow himself to be interrupted. He decided to stop. He decided to pause from what he was doing, what he had planned to do for that day, his to-do list. On my phone, I've got this app called Wonder List, and it tells me what I'm supposed to do every day. And he decided to, to turn off his phone and to turn and look. Scripture tells us that it wasn't until he stopped, it wasn't until he stopped that God spoke. It says these words, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, not before. When the Lord saw he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. First came the decision to stop. Then came hearing God's voice. First came the decision to stop and to turn from his path, the path he was on, his routine, First came the decision to stop and to turn. Then came, the, then came hearing God's voice. What if he hadn't stopped? Oh, no big deal. The Israelites would be in slavery for another thousand years. That's all, you know. The line of David that led to Jesus, maybe not. Actually meeting God face to face, he wouldn't have had that opportunity. No big deal, right? Becoming the leader of the liberation of tens of thousands of people becoming the father of a nation. Oh, that's all he would have missed out on. That's all, just from stopping. No big deal. He didn't see all that, though, did he? Isn't it interesting that God called him at this point in his life? Earlier in his life, he lived in Pharaoh's palace. He was the adopted son of the Pharaoh. He was the fair-haired child of the whole kingdom. He had power. He had influence. He had money. He had education. God could have called him when he was right there in the palace, and he could have probably captured the Pharaoh. He had all these resources, but no. Now he's at this end of his life. He's a nobody. He is in a dead-end job. He will never be famous. He has influence over no one that has two legs they walk on and a lot of four-legged creatures, but he is a nobody. Or so his senses tell him, his eyes and his ears tell him that his reality, he's nobody. But God sees a different reality. He sees his leader of a great nation God sees the deeper spiritual reality of who Moses is. And the last thing I would say about it, notice that God comes to him not when he's on a spiritual retreat, sadly not during a sermon from a pastor, 
not while he's off on a mission trip somewhere. It's, it's, it's like Monday morning and he's late for work. He's just trying to get the sheep. He's in his daily routine. But he makes that decision to stop. The spiritual life, I believe, comes with first embracing the truth. That it, there's no such thing as a spiritual life. It's life. We are spiritual. And so spiritual life is every piece of your life. It is you. To know that truth and embrace it, to, to take the red pill and say, I want to know the truth. That truth that that feeling in your stomach is pointing to, that there is more and then to turn to God and with that truth say, I want that. I want that. I turn to you. Because saying I want that is tantamount to saying I want to know who I am. And I want to know who I am is God. I want to know. Jesus, I want you to reorganize my life. I want to become who I truly am. Or maybe that beautiful prayer from the theologian Soren Kierkegaard. This beautiful prayer is so short, but says it all. He said, now, with God's help, I shall become myself. Now, with God's help, I shall become myself. In your bulletin this morning, I, I put something in there called a GPS, Grow, Pray, and Study, in case you feel led to go on this journey, a journey that we're just beginning today, a journey that's about becoming and about the truth of reality as a spiritual being. And I pray that you'll say yes to that journey and that like Moses, you'll say what is that? I'm going to go check that out. I'm going to stop what I'm doing. Because God doesn't want to give you a spiritual life. He wants to live a spiritual life with you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you today for the opportunity to begin anew. Whether we've heard one sermon or a thousand sermons, sometimes we can become cynical ourselves about change and about whether change is possible, about whether this is all there is. And even as believers, maybe we sometimes wonder if it's, this is all just made up, God, and that you know, we still feel the same. And I thank you, God, that you don't cast us out for our doubts, but that you continue to stick your hand out to us and say, saying, come with me. Let's live together. Let's live as spirit together. Your life hidden in my life. Your life hidden in my life. Your life hidden in my life so that you can find your life and find yourself. With your help, God, help us to become ourselves. For we ask all this in Jesus' name.